The SN2 mechanism. The SN2 mechanism is bimolecular nucleophilic substance. What it means to be bimolecular is that the rate equals a constant times the concentration of the substrate times the concentration of the reagent, which is a nucleophile. So here's my substrate. In this case, a secondary alkyl halide. And my reagent, which is some other halide maybe, or some other strong nucleophile. And I have concerted nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group in the same step. So my nucleophile performs backside attack, my leaving group leaves, and I get my product. Notice, the bond that was a wedge in the substrate is now a dash in the product. This is called inversion of configuration, and that's because we do backside attack. And then here's the leaving group, and we've substituted Y for X. So there are some requirements to make SN2 happen. For one thing, the substrate should have a good leaving group. This is why alkyl halides are excellent candidates. And then the other requirement for the substrate is that it either be primary or secondary. Does not work with tertiary because of sterics. As far as the reagent goes, the reagent needs to be a strong nucleophile to get SN2. So let's talk about the sterics and why tertiary doesn't work. And this is related to why we get inversion of configuration. R goes to S and S goes to R, for instance. So these balloon animals here represent the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of an alkyl halide. This means there's no electron density in this orbital. So this is the acceptor orbital where the nucleophile is going to put its electrons is somewhere into one of these balloons. So we can't put the electrons, for instance, in an occupied orbital, like the highest occupied molecular orbital. It's got to go in the LUMO. Furthermore, we have to put these electrons somewhere where there's actually electron density, one of the lobes. We cannot put it in a lobe. So, I'm sorry, we can't put it in a node where there's no electron density. So, our nucleophile electron density has to go into this backside lobe to form a bond with the carbon, and then the carbon to halide bond can break. So this requirement means that we are limited to backside attack. Backside attack is what gives us inversion of configuration. So say my substrate is S2-bromobutane and my reagent is sodium sulfhydride. So here I've got the sulfhydride ion, which is my nucleophile, and my substrate, the S2-bromobutane. This is carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, and carbon 4. And if you do a 90 degree rotation, you'll see that it is S. Anyhow, the sulfhydride has to do backside attack, forming a bond here. Right, so we got nuke attack and loss of a leaving group. So here's the transition state that's forming. And the nucleophilic attack gives you this bond, which is in the process of forming, between the sulfhydride and the central carbon. Now I should point out that this central carbon is a lot like a secondary carbocation in that the hydrogen, the methyl group, and the ethyl group are all in the same plane in the transition state, as opposed to having the central carbon being shifted out of the plane 
in the substrate. And then here is the bond that is breaking due to loss of a leaving group. And we've got a partial negative charge on both the sulfhydride and the bromide. So, the attack of our sulfhydride on the left-hand side of the molecule shifted the methyl group and the ethyl group and the hydrogen over to the opposite side of the carbon and caused the bromide to leave. So if you compare, we started off with our bromide on the right, we end up with our sulfhydride on the left. Furthermore, the methyl group was coming up and towards us and to the left. Now it's up and towards us and to the right, the ethyl group. Up and away from us and to the left. Now up and away from us and to the right. The hydrogen was coming down and flat and to the left. Now it's down and flat and to the right. So that's inversion. So whereas our substrate was S, our product is R. And it's butane dash two dash thiol. Now about sterics. In this case, our substrate was a secondary alkyl halide. It would go faster if it were primary, but this hydrogen here isn't too bulky. That means there's just enough space for the sulfhydride to do backside attack. Here's a tertiary alkyl halide. I've replaced the hydrogen that we had before with a methyl group. Now remember, this is a carbon with three hydrogens sticking out of it, much bulkier than a hydrogen. So, this nucleophilic attack that was trying to happen is prevented by the steric bulk. So this backside attack explains both why Primary and secondary are okay, but not tertiary, and it explains the inversion. There's one other thing that we should consider, and that is solvent effects. A protic solvent, like water, can form hydrogen bonds with the nucleophile, your reagent. Here I show water hydrogen bonding with a bromide ion, our nucleophile. That's a stabilizing interaction. In other words, it moves the energy down. Stabilizing your reagents effectively increases your activation energy. So in a protic solvent, the energy of my reactants might be very low, and my transition state is wherever it is, and then my products. The black trace represents doing this reaction in a protic solvent. Now, my solvent needs to be polar to stabilize the anion of the nucleophile, but it doesn't have to be capable of donating a hydrogen bond. For instance, here's acetone. There's a slight amount of partial positive charge on the central carbon. So you have some ion dipole interaction with the bromide ion, but it is not stabilizing to the extent of a hydrogen bond. That means my reactants start out at a much higher energy without the transition state being affected very much. So the activation energy with the protic solvent is big, whereas the activation energy with the aprotic solvent is much smaller. So like I said, acetone is a good example of a polar aprotic solvent. Here's DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. The sulfur has some partial positive charge, but not enough to form a hydrogen bond with a nucleophile. DMF, or dimethyl formamide, is another example. Right, so a small amount of partial positive charge here, but not enough to hydrogen bond. Another good example of polar aprotic solvent is uh, ethers, like diethyl ether. So when you see these, you should think, okay, we are favoring SN2.
Also remember, we want a strong nucleophile. That's a Lewis base. So it's got to be polarizable. And having a negative charge helps too. Although that is not absolutely essential. So examples of strong nucleophiles include thiols and thiolates. A thiol like RSH, very polarizable. A thiolate is RS minus. And the thiolate is stronger than the thiol. Now, oxyanions, like hydroxide and alkoxide. These are strong nucleophiles, but they're also strong bases. Be careful using oxyanions because the fact that they're a strong base means they're also going to favor E2 reactions as well as SN2. And finally, halides. The strongest one is iodide because it's the most polarizable. Bromide's pretty good too. Chloride is starting to get weak now. But it's still considered a strong nucleophile. It's just one of the weaker ones, much less nucleophilic than bromide or iodide. And fluoride is so small that it is not very polarizable. Okay, so fluoride is weak. Right? Iodide, bromide, and chloride are considered strong. 